So, um, uh, Balcony Salon has been running for 10 months since uh, last March. And for those of you who are new to this platform, we are a social network that encourages people to share ideas, knowledge, passion, and try to connect people with the like-minded. And for the past 10 months, we have held 15 events, including talks, um, performances, uh, pan pa discussion panels, and forums. And we have attracted an accumulated audience of over 2,000. And this is our 15th event and the first event of 2014, and we have a lot more to come. Um, the speaker today, Jerry, I met him in our mathematics session. Uh, he was one of the audience, and he said he studied math in uh, university. So, and he said he would be interested to deliver a talk as well. So I asked him, so which math mathematician are you going to talk about? He said, he said, I'm going to talk about Spanish painting. So here we are. And before you start, I think there's a question everyone wants to ask as well. So you are, you study mathematics in college, and you're not a contrader. How, you are as far away as possible as to Spanish arts. How, how why do you start to appreciate Western arts and painting in particular? Uh, well, um, I think most people have a thing for beautiful things. Uh, me too. So, <laughs> just thought it would be it would be interesting to learn a little more about Western oil paintings. And when I was a kid, I started reading a little about it. And then, when I got into college, I had this uh, great opportunity to study art history in Spain for a month. And um, that's what got me into uh, you know really learning uh, Western oil paintings. Um, I guess in particular Spanish paintings because um, I did study it in Spain and it was a Spanish focus. Okay, um, the stage is all yours. Right. Thank you. Uh, how can I move the slides? Do I just feel Great. Alright, so, um, this, everybody. Um, I'm going to try to uh, do this talk in English. Um, and um, you know, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand at the still salon. I'm trying to share some of my experience learning Western oil paintings and appreciating them with you. It could be right, it could be wrong, because a lot of them are indeed normative statements that we try to make. Um, and also, if my facts are wrong, please raise your hand and say, hey, you got that year wrong. It's actually painted in like 1764 instead of 1762. Um, you know, uh, so it, make it interactive, I'll ask questions. Uh, I'll try to keep it lively. It's not supposed to be a lecture, uh, and let's try to make it one. All right. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a brief history of uh, Western Western art history. Uh, am I blocking anyone over here? No. Okay. Um, and in particular, I picked out three Spanish artists: uh, El Greco, Velázquez, and Goya, to talk about. They are the first three grand masters of uh, of Spanish uh, oil paintings. Um, and through them, I'm trying to explore with you uh, different eras of uh, paintings in the West. Uh, we'll go through Renaissance all the way till uh, Neoclassicism, or as some, some people would call it Romanticism. And we'll probably stop there because we won't have enough time, but if you're interested in talking about Picasso and Dali with me after the talk, I'm more than happy uh, to chat. All right, um, let's move on. So one question that I guess at least bothers me, I don't know if that bothers you guys, is oh, why do you want to go to an art museum, right? Like, does anyone want to offer any you know, answer to this question? Why? Kill time. Kill time? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a perfectly reasonable answer to you know to kill like the three hours of your time. Like, you have nothing to do. You're like, okay, I'm traveling. I'm traveling in Europe. I'm having a wonderful time. What do I do this afternoon? Yeah, let's go to the National Gallery. Uh, but why? Why do you go to the National Gallery instead of going to, I don't know, like, see a show or something? Uh, because I think they have a whole bunch of collection for the glory of the local culture. Local culture, definitely, yeah. You can definitely see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, traditions e exhibited through, you know, English artists in, in London or, like, French artists, or in general, like, you know, just all the great artists that the, the, the great museums have a great collection of all these artists. Um, and then you go to the museum, you see this, these paintings, you go like, yeah, that's kind of pretty, but okay, that, that's that. Like, wh am I learning anything really? I, I, at least I have asked myself this question a lot of times, and I had this, uh, I slowly gained this understanding of why I think I want to go to an art museum um, as I went to more and more art museum and not really understanding what I'm doing. Um, so, 
Clearly you want to see a thing of beauty. Sometimes you want to see you know, Van Gogh's uh, sunflowers because it's kind of pretty. Um, and you want to get some emotional provocation. You want to see some very dark, powerful paintings and you go, wow, that, that, you know, that really struck my heart. Uh, or if you're an art student, uh, God forbid there should be any here because they all, all pick on my mistakes. Um, you know, you'll, learn, you'll learn the painting techniques. Or like one more thing that I recently just, just realized is you can really understand the ideas behind the paintings. It's like reading a novel. It's like seeing a movie. It's like, what is that painter trying to, trying to express? What is, what is that patron who's behind the painter trying to express? Um, so one example uh, that I actually, last, last August I was in uh, Paris, I was, I, was watch, I was looking at this painting that's a very famous painting that probably a lot of you have it in your middle school corridors, right, the gleaners. And you, you might have asked yourself, okay, that's just you know, three women picking, picking leftover grains from the field. What is so cool about that? Um, it turns out that this painting was painted during a time when the government was trying to uh, promote itself as um, you know, uh, as guiding its people to a very happy and glorious and harmonious life. And yet, this painter painted this painting whereby these farmers, so these are the people that work on the field, trying to help people collect their harvest. And at the end of the day, at the end of the working day, they are then allowed to pick the leftover grains to carry home to feed their kids. When this painting came out, it was very scandalous. Um, because the government really hated it. I was like, what are you trying to do? You're trying to break the perfect image I'm trying to create here. And that's why this painting earned such a high reputation in that era and therefore in, in, the, in the history of art. But without that background, there is no way that I would pick this painting and say, I'm going to pay 50 million US dollars for this. There is some significance attached. And in order to understand the significance of paintings, you kind of have to have an understanding of uh, the, the background of the time. You need to know uh, what is you know, the social political environment, what is the economic, what is the religious scientific development context of the age. Um, you need to put yourself in their shoes, in people who are people in the 1500s try to imagine what they have been seeing and why a painting would be great if it presents their eyes because they've never seen something like this before. Like for us, we have the internet, we can see so many things. Nothing is so cool to us anymore. Like at least it's, gonna, it's getting harder and harder for things to be cool to us. But put yourself in their shoes and you probably will understand why things uh, aren't amazing and why they're important paintings. And, and lastly, it's uh, facts versus normative statements. As I said, I will try to guide you through a lot of facts and probably offer my own opinions, but you know, feel, definitely have your, uh, form your own opinion. You can like paintings that I don't. Right, so just quickly run through a brief timeline of Western paintings. Um, you know, we, we, uh, I didn't bother categorizing ancient paintings. You know, you can basically imagine anything prehistoric on the wall to like Roman, Greek, pottery, and all the way up to the 4th century AD. And then you have the medieval paintings, it's after the Roman Empire broke up, all the way to the 14th century. And then you have the Great Renaissance, when every, where, which is everybody's favorite, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, and it goes on to Baroque. Uh, for like 150 years. And there's some subcategories here. You have mannerism, rococo, uh, and then move on to new classicism, where uh, you know, which somebody uh, uh, would call it romanticism also. And then things start to pick up. Some you have impressionism, post-impressionism, uh, impressionism, symbolism, and things just get all wild after that. Every 10 years, somebody new comes up with like a new idea, um, etc. So we're just going to go. Uh, I'm going to quickly uh, talk about medieval painting. Probably take a minute or two, and then go on to. Uh, Renaissance and then Baroque and Neoclassicism. I'll probably mention a few painters at the end of that with Impressionism, um, etc. All right, all cool? Are we ready to go on this journey? Yeah. All right, let's do it. All right, Spanish artists. There are a lot of them, by the way. Um, but I'm picking three out of the six here. Uh, this is Museo del Prado, which is the main museum in, in Madrid. And that's the Reina Sofia Museum, which houses most of uh, Picasso and, uh, and Dali. I don't know if you, people have been to Spain, Madrid? Yes? Yay. Um, yeah, so these, these two are the main museums. Um, I attached the, uh, the time period with these masters after that. All right, uh, the few themes uh, we're going to look at, uh, who pays for the paintings? It, it, it might strike you as a little weird because you're like, okay, I'm a painter, I just, I just paint, and they're trying to sell the painting, right? That was not the case back then, 400 years ago, 500 years ago. Somebody has to pay for you to do a painting. And then you have to secure pretty, uh, a pretty uh, secure patronage. Somebody has to constantly support you to be doing paintings. Otherwise, you can't support yourself. It's not like, oh, I just paint, I put in a gallery. The business model was not the same back then. Okay, um, so what do they want? And ideas behind paintings. 
there could be a whole, uh, like a whole host of ideas that try and express, uh, which we'll explore, and there will be aesthetic ideals, uh, you know, harmony versus tension, um, you have uh, the chaotic versus structural, you have the techniques, brush stroke is a pretty big part, you know, like broad, wild brush strokes could give you a sense of freedom, and a very fine brush stroke which give you a sense of meticulousness, uh, which we'll also see through the examples. Um, and you have colors, and compositions also uh, serve to uh, explore some of the ideas. All right, medieval. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, I I'm not a big fan of medieval paintings because they're kind of boring. Um, so I'm just gonna you know, spend like one side talking about it. Uh, so who mostly pays for medieval paintings? Uh, the Catholic Church, very rich back then. Basically, just dominates uh, most of the art scene, um, and also certain states, uh, kings, dukes, like they they pay for things to be painted. Uh, oops. <laughs> Um, uh, Subcategories you can definitely explore uh, on your own. Uh, just uh, it, it's about a thousand years, so there's definitely some uh, subcategories that there are. And one thing you see is uh, there is a lack of perspective and proportion. So if you see uh, uh, the Virgin sitting in the middle and all the saints sitting uh, next to them, do you really think Virgin Mary is uh, twice the height of other saints? Probably not, right? Uh, they're they're not really trying to. Uh, Create a sense of a realism, like you know, a, a sense of like proportion, and it looks kind of plain and flat. You don't really know like who's at the front, at the back, um, and most of the material is on wood, walls, and panels, uh, because anytime somebody builds a church, they need to find somebody to decorate it. So a lot of the paintings actually ended up on the walls, and mosaics is also a big part, but I'm not going to talk about it. Um, let's just go on. The more interesting time period, Renaissance. Apparently, this painting was in uh, Hong Kong a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah, not this one. Oh, the, the next one. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't there to see it, so I was just basically guessing. This is Botticelli, uh, the Birth of Venus, uh, 1485. Um, so the Renaissance happened. What what happened? Um, so after a thousand years of Middle Ages and. Uh, people started to get a little bored. They, they, all of a sudden, one day they were like, okay, why don't we bring back the Roman ideals, the Greek ideals? They were, they were great. Uh, the Romans and the Greeks, uh, they weren't very kind to Christians when Christianity first started. They persecuted the Christians. So when Christianity took over, they, they didn't quite like the pagan gods of, of the Roman and Greek mythology either. They didn't quite like Jupiter or Venus or whoever. They wanted, they used painting as a means to express uh, the ideas the church wants to express. And clearly that doesn't involve Jupiter or Venus or anything like that. They want to talk about how, she, how uh, Jesus Christ suffered for, uh, for the human beings, uh, you know, the, the, the divinity and, and greatness of, uh, of Jehovah the God and, and the saints, etc. Um, but uh, around the around, uh, Renaissance period, um, there is a very important family that really uh, gave rise to this new movement, which is the Medici family in Florence. <clears throat> there were a few ideals they wanted to bring back uh, to, the, uh, to the art world. Uh, and one thing is uh, they wanted, again, to explore the Roman and Greek mythology. Because there were a lot of uh, important uh, lessons, moral lessons, that they can draw from these, uh, these ancient mythology. So uh, one important uh, difference then in the subject matter of Renaissance paintings is you see the return of Greek and Roman uh, mythology subject. Uh, for example, this is Peter Mavera. Uh, this is the one that was in Hong Kong, right? No. So. no? Still not? No. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's on any it is in Hong Kong. Yeah. The form of product would be fine. Just ah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the church still pays. This, uh, the church definitely still pays. Uh, but the, the sort of the, the philosophical movement also brought back as I said, the Roman and Greek ideals, uh, it's a rebirth. Uh, Renaissance means rebirth. Uh, so it's a rebirth of the Roman and Greek ideals. Uh, so uh, some other families, not only the Medici, some other, uh, some other patrons started to pay for paintings that not only paint uh, saints, uh, Mary, Jesus, etc. They started painting uh, Roman and Greek themed things. Uh, Two other important characteristics. Uh, one is a form of ideal beauty. Uh, I don't really have a pointer here, but basically back then, if you look at anybody's, any pretty woman's faces in these paintings, the, the ratio between their forehead, the nose, and their chins, it's basically exactly the same. Because it's ideal. It's, it's harmonious. That's the perfect ratio. And no one should ever paint like, like anything else. Um, so in some sense, to me, it, it's, it's a little boring. Because everybody basically like, has the same feature. And it's, it's a sense of um, calmness. Uh, they, we'll see later in Baroque that they like the, the dramas, but for Renaissance, it's, you know, 
people, a, a lot of the paintings, it's about people sitting in places, standing in places. It's like a perfect shot. It's not when things are happening. Um, so it, it's the harmony that, that, is, uh, that is dominating in Renaissance. And then one other thing is you, you start to see a little more perspective applied. Meaning, just now when we looked at the medieval paintings, you don't really know who's at the front, who's at the back, the proportions are just all twisted. Here people started to care a little more about, okay, this should look a little big up front, this should look a little smaller at the back, and have a sense of depth. Uh, we'll start to see this evolve as we go on. Uh, so, clearly, everybody knows this painting, like Louvre, right? Like, everybody's taking pictures, like, everybody's ignoring all the other paintings in the hall. It's just taking pictures of this picture. Um, so we have Da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael as the three most uh, outstanding painters of the era. And you have Titian, Botticelli, Van Eyck, Gilles. Um Like, this is uh, Adam and Eve, uh, painted by the northern artist Duet. And then you have um, a School of Athens. It's in the Vatican. It's painted by Raphael. Uh, and Michelangelo, this is the Sistine Chapel painting, this Genesis. Um, as you can see, this, uh, can you go back one, one page? Yeah, you can now start to see there is actually a sense of depth. Right? Imagine the medi medieval painting you just saw, it was all plain. This one you can actually start to see through, you see, wow, there's a sense of depth. So somebody's actually walking out. Um, uh, right, let's go on to the next one. So, after a while, you know, this like harmony and stuff, it's, it's all cool, it's all great. You know, as with, with all things fashion, there, there are cycles, right? Like, people have stayed within a harmonious ideal for like 150 years. They start to get a little bored. They're like, okay, this is boring. We need something to happen. So, there's sort of like a sub, sub movement is called mannerism. It's finding some way to express emotions. Because back then, everybody's like, okay, I'm, I'm standing still. I have, I have my perfect ratio. Like, there is no emotion. I'm all cold. Um, but here's like, okay, uh, we, need, we need some tension because otherwise it's going to be really boring. Michelangelo is one of the guys that actually pioneered this. Like, this is one of his sketches for, for a character in his painting. You can see the torque in his muscle. Like, he paints huge muscles. If you see huge muscles in the Renaissance time period, that's Michelangelo. He loves big muscles. Um, and, and that guy's turning, right? You can see, like, something's happening. There's some tension in that figure. Um, and the notable artists we have Michelangelo, Tintoretto, and El Greco, which is. Uh, whom we're going to talk about next. Uh, right, El Greco. So, uh, the name is actually not his real name. Oops. Um, uh, let's go on to the next page. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to try to pronounce this. I tried it yesterday. It was a bit of a shit show. Um, so, he was, he was born in Crete. And as with all masters back then, uh, he got his training in Italy. Because Italy is the place to be. Um, and they didn't have internet back then, so you kind of have to go to Italy to do it. Um, and um, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you need to secure a patron for you to survive. You need to have people constantly giving you work. They have people commissioning you to pay for this church, pay for that church, etc. Um, he was doing pretty well in Italy, but he could never achieve the height he was think hoping to achieve. He wanted to do like what Michelangelo did. He wanted to paint the Sistine Chapel. He wanted to do like crazy awesome things. But you know, all of these places were already filled by Italian uh, painters. So he looked around and he said, wow, Spain is an up-and-coming country. Uh, they basically just reunited and they had, you know, Columbus set sail to the, to the Americas in 1492, you know, they're, they're getting a lot of riches. Back then the king of Spain is also the Holy Roman Empire uh, and also uh, the Austrian and Hungarian lands. So like the, the Spanish Empire, the Habsburg Empire is actually pretty, pretty prominent and pretty powerful. So he was like, okay, let me try and secure the patronage over there because even though they're pretty rich, they don't have a lot of painters. They're not very good with art yet. You know, it's like Paul of Sun got really rich, but not yet uh, caught up in the art scene. So um, he went over to Spain, and that was stuck. Oops. Why don't you try to pronounce it? <laughs> <laughs> Domenicos. <laughs> Theotokopoulos. <laughs> right, I didn't. Um, no, I'll keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he moved over to a city called Toledo. And please, if that moved, can somebody remind me so I can stop talking about it? Yeah. Okay, 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 sure. All right, Toledo. So, uh, people have been to Toledo? Anybody? Yeah? Loved it? Yeah. Hate it? Okay, love it. Great. <laughs> um, so that's actually where I spent my one month studying art history. Um, so that was the seat of the, the king of Castile and Aragon uh, back then. But they actually just, uh, they, they basically moved a lot of the things to Madrid already, but that's still a very important uh, city in Spain. 
the, the cathedral, the main cathedral in Spain back then was in Toledo. Um, and he moved there, he, he hoped to get, you know, patronized by King uh, Felipe II. And um, so he, uh, he, 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 got, he went there, he was already kind of famous, he had some connection, he had some recommendation letters, you know, probably two or three. And then um, he, he just went to the local uh, convents and like churches and stuff and said, hey, you know what? You just built this awesome church, can I paint the altarpiece? Uh, or like somebody actually came and fired him to do this. Um, so he actually did, uh, he actually did three very famous altarpieces and like just big paintings for the local churches and, and convents. Uh, and it was great. People there were awed by this. Just imagine Spain once again, just gained fame, just gained power, but they haven't really seen a lot of great paintings. Most paintings are in Italy, once again, they don't have internet, they, they don't get to see it. Just imagine your, your ordinary Joe Schmo, like, you know, walking, farmers, peasants, they're just walking, they've never seen something like that. And they just instantly, like, struck awe into everybody's, everybody's heart in, in Toledo. He instantly became a celebrity. It took him two years, though, to, to paint this. Um, the, the disrobing of the Christ, uh, I'm probably not going to explain these paintings in detail, but basically these are all religious events. Uh, El Greco is really famous for painting religious paintings and portraits as well, she, oh, we'll see later. Uh, and, okay, let, let, let's move on to the next one. Next one. <laughs> right. And then, and then, so he, uh, so he, uh, so he finally got the, the, the attention of the king. The king back then just built a castle northwest of Madrid called uh, El Escorial. Oops. Oops. Uh, uh, this one. Yeah. Right. So the Escorial uh, Palace. Um, and back then there was a very important event that was happening in the religious history. Hold on. Okay. Um, religious history. So, uh, People know the difference between Protestants and Catholics, more or less, somewhat. Um, so there was the Reformation, the Great Reformation that was going on. Uh, certain people uh, in Northern Europe believe that the Catholic Church is corrupted. As an institution, it was not really functioning properly, and they wanted to get rid of uh, sort of the institution between each individual and God, um, and decided that you know they they want just to have uh, me and God you know directly talking to uh, sort of like having this this communication. And um, as a side effect, they basically, the Protestants also wanted to ditch all the saints, the Catholic Church, um, I don't actually remember the verb, but basically like pronounced, uh, declared. Um, so again, art form, uh, art as a form of uh, ideas, expressions. Um, people in the Catholic camp decided to launch the, this thing called the Counter-Reformation. It's like, you guys are reforming, we're gonna counter-reform. We're gonna say, no, our ideals are still the best, right? So, what they needed was paintings, paintings that can express the Catholic ideas. So, this painting is about uh, a saint called Saint Morris, and the story is basically about him uh, uh, getting killed off by like a Roman emperor. So he's a master. So in the end, he got he got to be, be a saint. Um, so he, the, uh, Felipe the second said, "Okay, Greco, paint this painting. Talk about the life story of Saint Morris." Okay. El Greco got very excited. He went home, he painted, he spent you know, a year or so painting this painting and gave it to the king. And the king hated it. He said, like, look at this painting. The king went, what the hell are you talking about? Like, what is this story? I don't understand what this story is about. So what El Greco did was, uh, you can't really see it clearly here, but you, you can see uh, St. Morris was somewhere in the background here, somewhere in, somewhere in the foreground here and, and right here. This is St. Morris. What El Greco was trying to achieve was to say, okay, I'm trying to tell a story. I'm putting different parts of this story in the same painting. Okay, so when it started, he was at the back, you know, he was telling the, uh, the emperor he, he, he doesn't want to harass the local Christians in the front, you know, the king said, no, you have to do it, and over here it's basically like saying, okay, no, you're getting killed. Um, but the king didn't like this idea because, once again, just imagine you're a peasant, you're like, a, you're like an uneducated guy, you don't really know the stories of the Bible that well, you come to see this painting, you want to get an, an easy to understand idea right away, right? You want to look at it and go like, okay, I know what this is talking about. But no, for like an ordinary, like uneducated man, this doesn't mean anything. Like, if you just look at him, like, what? So the king didn't like this at all. He's like, you didn't do a good job. I tried to hire you to paint paintings and use this as a tool for counter-reformation. You completely failed me. And I, basically after that, El Greco never ever got a commission from the king ever again. <laughs> well, it's not really that sad because he, he is still um, loved by uh, the, the Toledanos as, as 
we were called the people in Toledo. Uh, so he, he sort of lived a happy life afterwards. He, he got uh, commissioned to do a lot of other paintings, portraits and stuff. So uh, the one very powerful tool El Greco has for his paintings is his color. Uh, he likes to add a little shade of blue, some sort of like darkness into his palette. So when you look at it, it's not very comfortable. It's not like your ordinary, when you look at it, you won't go like, oh, you know, I can put it by my bedside and go to sleep with it every day. Like, there is some sense of darkness, mysticism, um, divinity, serenity, some sort of spirit spirituality with his, with his colors. Uh, and, you know, back then you don't really just go to a shop and even till this day, you don't really just go and buy paint from the shops. You, you do it yourself and he definitely, this is one of his very um, important characteristics. Um, and in terms of composition, because it's religious paintings, he likes to, he likes to relate uh, divine events to secular events, and that means he has a two-world composition. So you see, up top you have the divine world, and at the bottom you have, you know, the sort of like the secular world. Um, this painting, actually, the burial of uh, Count Orgaz, uh, actually, we'll talk about it in a bit. But all of these portraits down here, this is actually a contemporary event of El Greco. It's basically uh, a local count has died, and people came to his bureau, uh, his his uh, funeral. And you can s basically all of these faces are real faces of real people back then. It was considered as one of the finest portraits uh, of his time. Basically, like just a portrait of local uh, gentry. Um, all right, so. Move on to the next one. It's a two-world composition and also elongation. I don't think anyone would have a head that small compared to the body. <laughs> he loves uh, to make things long and thin, and also have a smaller head. And for whatever reason, that really lends to some sense of spirituality. Once again, this is part of the mannerism movement, which means they want to seek tension. They want to seek something that's a little wrong that will that will make you think some sort of sense of divinity and serenity in his paintings. And somehow this works. Like when you look at it, you go like, okay, he is definitely no ordinary man. Um, there, is, there, is, there is a sense of something different, something spiritual in his paintings. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but actually in the painting just now, he also has the, has the same, uh, same hand position. Th this hand position is actually very trademarky of a uh, mockish of El Greco. Do, when you take pictures of yourself, like, do you ever do this? You probably don't. And you either do this or you do this. You, you, don't, you don't really like combine these two fingers and put it on your chest. Once again, this is tension. This is something different. This is out of the ordinary. Like you, you probably won't notice it right away, but your brain is is thinking to itself, hmm, something's a little odd here. Like once again, mannerism techniques. He's trying to he's trying to add something different to the painting so that you get a sense of tension in your head. Um, so. El Greco is considered basically the first Grand Master of Spain. Before that, you know, some people call it like a barbarian country with no art and, and culture. But um, you, you have Picasso. Picasso loves copying El Greco. You have uh, this painting. Is, uh, if you guys know much about Picasso, does anybody know what the Blue Period means? Does it ring a bell? The Blue Period of Picasso. Yeah. This is basically like when his good friend Casa Hemos uh, committed suicide in 1901 in Paris. Uh, Picasso entered into this, this period called Blue Period, it was pretty depressing. But he basically copied the composition from uh, the first one. And yeah, he, he just loves doing this. <laughs> and I also love doing this. <laughs> yeah, that, that was in Toledo uh, with a bunch of friends. Uh, the Coke bottle doesn't really work. But... Alright, so El Greco lived until 1614 and uh, at that point, the Baroque movement is already starting, and that's sort of like a follow-up to the mannerism ideals. It just pushed it a little, little more forward. Uh, it's like we love the dramas, TNT. We love drama. Uh, yeah. Okay. I guess you guys can get those. Um, um, and they, uh, they, they also love to use all kinds of techniques to, to, uh, to talk, to express drama and express tension. Let, let's take a look at. Um, uh, so, you know. Renaissance loves harmony, you know, people standing the beautiful ideal, and you have the Baroque. They're like, okay, we want to, we want to have something happening, right? The world is a happening. Things are changing. Um, that word is Italian, chiaro oscuro, which means a strong contrast between darkness and brightness. As you can see from this painting, it's like a very, very strong light shining over here. It's like, whoa, it's very dramatic. Um, let's move on to the red. Right. 
So there are two leading philosophical movements uh, in that time, or like rather like a pair that, that is worth exploring. One is vanitas, uh, and uh, I'd like to translate this into Mandarin as fuying. <laughs> so basically, at that point, people figured out that you know you can't live forever, duh. Um, and and one one group of group of people just decided why why are there no why were there no still lives provided? Well, just remember again who is paying for the paintings, right? The churches, the states. Why would they commission a still life painting if they don't agree with what the still life paintings ideals are? They kind of have to say, okay, there's a painting I want you to paint for me, and the idea I want to express is this. Um, back then, before the 16th and 17th century, people don't really care about like painting these things. What, what message is this showing? Um, so, still life is definitely one thing. You'll start to see more and more still life in paintings as, as Baroque evolves. And then you have the Carpe Diem movement, which leads to later Rococo movement, uh, which is just excessive, excessive indulgence um, and, and luxury. So, uh, you know, now we have some wealthy individuals in this crowd uh, of, of patrons now. Um, so there are certain ideas that they want to express and could be, uh, uh, could be d uh, discussed in paintings. You have Caravaggio, you have Rembrandt, you have Rubens, you have Poussin, you have Velázquez, who we're going to talk about next. All right, this painting is uh, Rembrandt, uh, The Night Watch. And you have this one, pretty famous, Pervering one. And Diego Velázquez. Okay, so I was born in 1599, it was 15 years before, uh, before Greco was dead, um, and he was born in the south southwest city of Seville. Uh, Seville. Seville. People have been to Seville? 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 Yes. All right, so it seems like the same people, I guess it's not surprising. <laughs> All right, um, so let's move on. All right, so uh, El Greco did an okay job gaining fame at an early age. Uh, this guy did an awesome job. So when he was he was uh, 25, he already he already uh, got recommended to go and find a king. Uh, they were like, "Wow, you're really good. You should you should seek the patronage of the king." One year later, he became the court painter. That, that's pretty that's a pretty big deal. 26 years old. Uh, I guess a lot of you here are like 26 plus. Just imagine you know working as the top painter of the country. Um, and in my in my sub in my title of this presentation, I mentioned that Alberto Velázquez and Goya has the divine, the secular, and the nightmare, and he paints a lot of, of real things, real people. They don't, he, he didn't paint that much, that many religious paintings. He did do uh, certainly you know, crucifixion pictures and stuff, but most of his paintings are real-life secular paintings. Um, that he painted when he was 21, basically, and he won a prize, and he got just a lot of attention. So he was painting, and uh, this painting is about um, the god of wine, uh, the guy in the middle. Um, and does he really look like a god? And like the people that are hanging out with him? Not really. You know, it's like uh, look like a bunch of drunkards just off, off work. You know, just hanging out. Um, so this painting, uh, he was actually pretty proud of it when he painted it. And then uh, Rubens, Rubens back then, he was another, I mentioned earlier, like another great Baroque master. He was actually an ambassador to uh, Spain for nine months for the French court. And Rubens was like, wow, you know, you're a really talented guy. Um, but, you know, your, your muscle painting is, like, the, the muscle you painted was just not that great. Um, you know, you can improve. Why don't you go to Italy? Once again, no internet. Um, so, so he had, so, uh, Velázquez was like, oh, that's a great idea. So we talked to the king, and the king said, okay, why don't you go ahead? Like, you know, I can get my other painters to paint my portraits. So uh, he was asked, so uh, Velázquez was, was basically going to Italy to copy the paintings of Michelangelo. He do a study of them, try to learn the muscles, trying to learn the Italian masters. And as we'll see later on, a lot of painters, and as El Greco did, like, people well need to go to Italy. Uh, as my art history professor once said, you know, you're never the same person after you've been to Italy. Uh, probably for you too, like for all contemporary people. Italy people? Yes? Slightly more? Okay. Fashion, design, all that good stuff. Um, so, a, a few characteristics. Um, chiaroscuro, like the light starts to have an effect on things. Um, you have still life, it's probably not very clear. You have pots and stuff up front. Um, and then he went to Italy. Right, so this one is already quite some improvement in the muscle painting. That was painted during his first visit to Italy. Once again, it's about gods, but pagan gods, so this cannot possibly be painted before the Renaissance, right? Like, if you just see this painting, you're like, okay, this is about pagan gods, nowhere is this painted before Renaissance. 
Um, so this is about Apollo, the guy, you know, shiny, shiny guy, come in to tell Vulcan, which is god of uh, uh, the forge, that, well, somehow Vulcan managed to marry Venus, and Venus managed to get an affair with Mars. Uh, so, so Apollo's coming here to tell, her, to tell him that, dude, your wife is having an affair with this uh, other god. <laughs> um, once again, um, you know, pots and stuff. You know, in the past, people were not paying extra things. It's pretty expensive to buy paints, actually, and it takes time. So, um, you know, all these things, all these, all these things hanging out. These are like still life stuff, and um, nudity. So, Spain is an extremely conservative country. It is even more conservative than Italy back then. Like, people are, sc are scandal by these things, like nude people who, who who do these things. So, this is already an Italian influence. He was in Italy. He was like, okay, there are a lot of naked paintings. It's muscles. It's really awesome. I want to do this. So he, uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, nakedness in this, and the masculine figures, as I mentioned earlier, is, is influenced by Michelangelo. Right? Oops. So then he returned, returned, and then um, he, he did a lot of royal paintings. So we'll just like quickly talk about the symbolism and stuff in the royal paintings. He painted. So one thing, um, this guy's uh, Felipe the Fourth. So he's the grandson of uh, you know the the. The, the king that turned down El Greco uh, a few decades ago. Uh, he's got pretty ugly lips. The reason is the Habsburgs, they love um, to have brothers marrying sisters and cousins marrying each other, so like keeping the, the blood pure, and that doesn't really bode well for the, for the looks, um, or like the, 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 the brains. Um, so this is called the Habsburg lips. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it's like the, 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 lip, the lip beneath is a little more like tilted forward in the front. It's pretty pinkish. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about incest a little more in a bit. Um, so symbolism. Uh, back then, they need paintings of kings in government buildings, in churches. Uh, they need to express the right message. Once again, painting as a form of expression. Um, so I'm just going to talk, talk quickly about a few pretty common things. And you see, when you go to the Louvre or when you go to whatever, like the next museum, you can see what they're trying to say. So if an authoritative figure holds a letter in his hand, that means uh, people, uh, that means he's a very just ruler. People write to him to seek advice and to seek justice. And if you see a dog, that's always a sign of loyalty. So basically, you will see a lot of paintings, royal paintings, with, with dogs involved, and it's always loyalty. Uh, it's the, the light is not great here, but there's another very uh, interesting example of Velázquez's uh, paintings. He would do a, paint, uh, do a painting first, and he'd be like, mm, this doesn't look great. So he used some chemical to wipe out some of the stuff he did, and then repaint somewhere else. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but there's like another foot here. So, uh, because after like hundreds, hundreds of years, uh, the paint, like the chemical he used, faded. So you can start to see like you know, there's like another leg up here. But yeah, you, you can definitely Google it if you're interested, or take out a film right now. I don't mind. Um, but yeah, it's, it's called arrepentimiento, which means I am uh, like regret. I'm regretful. I, I regret it. Um, all right. Um, and also, so you you will have um, you know all the royal families in the in the Habsburg family. They have they have one color ribbon. And for that, that's pink. That's basically saying, I belong to the Habsburgs. And for the male uh, members, you will hold a baton, which means the army listens to me, because I can, I, can, uh, I, can, I can lead the army. Um, the horses, only the male members can have both of their legs up. And only the, f the female members can only have one leg up. So these are the pretty interesting uh, symbolisms you can, you can tell. Um, well, yeah, what does this mean? Justice. Justice, right. So this is the Pope, Innocentio X. Um, so Velázquez got really, really trusted by the king. The king, uh, the king actually, so uh, Aposentador Mayor, that, basically that gives him the right to guard the key to the king's chambers. Right? That's a pretty big deal, right? Like, like it's basically trusting him with, with the deeper secrets of, of the king. Um, he, got, he got along with the king really, really, really well. Um, and he really cares about that also. He makes sure everybody knows about that. We'll see it in the, in the painting afterwards. Um, and the king asked him to set up an art academy in Spain because, you know, they started to have a few painters now in Spain, but they, they're still not the center of art that people, that, that the Spanish people, like the Spanish king envisions his kingdom to be. So he was trying to set up an art academy, and then buying some titians, buying some you know, other paintings. 
and um, he did a lot of very, very good portraits. Um, I'm not going to talk about them one by one, but you, 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 know, you can Google them. It's very real. It looks like a photograph, basically. Right. And this is a very famous painting, uh, Las Meninas. Uh, it's in the Prada Museum, and when I actually first saw it in person, I was so struck by awe because it was at the end of a very long, like, oval-shaped room. And when I walked into the room, I literally thought I was looking into a room. The sense of depth is amazing. But you can't really see this in a painting that much, though, because, yeah, like, once again, like, internet has its disadvantages. Um, actually, yeah, if you have the opportunity, you should definitely go to the museums to see the paintings themselves. So you can see the brush strokes, you can get the sense of uh, depth and stuff that internet pictures don't really, really give you. Um, so, what is this? Loyalty, exactly. Uh, this is the Infanta, which means uh, she's a little princess. Um, she didn't live long, incest, blah. Um, the king and the queen in the mirror. Uh, this dude is the painter himself. And you probably can't see it really clearly, but he's got a red cross in front of his chest because he just got promoted by the king to do something else. Uh, he loves that. He, he makes sure everybody knows about it. Um, a bunch of dwarfs. Um, yeah, back then it was kind of twisted. The, the courts keep dwarves to keep them entertained, you know, just like make fun of them constantly. And, you know. um, and there are a lot of paintings here, actually like quite a few of them are paintings that Velázquez uh, bought from Italy. Uh, you can't really see them, but in the, in, the real, in the real painting you can kind of see what paintings they are. Uh, and this is, this is this painting itself. So he was trying to you know, take a snapshot of what, what he's doing when he was actually painting this painting. Um, let's see, so this is a lot. Okay. So, once again, Picasso loves doing this thing. Uh, he painted 57 variations of this in one year. He's like, let me just play around with this idea. And, um, yeah, this is, this is the cross, see that? This is, this is the painter, and, uh, and Picasso's like, yeah, he loves the cross, I'll paint the cross out here. Uh, the dog. Definitely the dog. Uh, this is one of his last paintings. Um, one interesting thing to see is uh, his brush strokes are getting pretty out of hand. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's a great thing. Because he can basically like paint things like using very, very easy, very wild brush strokes and yet make sure like you know that is actually what he wants to paint. Um, this story, uh, once again, it's a pagan story. Uh, it's about this this woman, uh, I think Arachne? Yeah. So he basically told everybody, like, you know, she's really, really good at weaving. And Ath Ath Athena, the, 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 the goddess of wisdom and the goddess, turns out also the goddess of weaving, uh, decided that this mortal human being is uh, crossing the bounds. So they had a weaving context, uh, contest, and clearly Athena won, and Athena <coughs> then made this woman a spider. And that's why spiders weave. Ah, sorry, yeah, just a uh, fable. Right. Right. So Velázquez basically had a very happy life. He uh, he really went along well with the king, uh, and now we're on to you know the 1730s, where Rococo uh, started. And uh, have you heard of Rococo when it comes to like furniture and stuff? You know, Rococo <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pushing the copy DM idea to the extreme. It's like let's just put a lot of decorations, a lot. It doesn't matter if you like it or not, we're putting it in. Um, so it's not saying Vanitas that that movement has died. It's just that the Vanitas people are kind of quiet. They, they, they paint still lives, and, right? they, they hang in their living rooms. But here it's like, it's very pretentious, it's very loud. They have all kinds of like really elaborate costumes in the operas. And you know, it's just really getting over the top. Um, you have a lot of you know, little fat angels, uh, you know, love and you know, enjoyment, luxury, all that stuff, you know, just too, it's just too much. You just look at it and you go like, oh, it's all over my head. So, once again, as with all fashion cycles, once certain things get pushed over the top, what happens? Oh, right, something, like, they want to revert back. So you have, you have Renaissance, you have, like, you know, very simple, plain, harmonious, like, not moving to the drama, 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 ooh, too much drama. Let's go back to be quiet and nice and simple. And that's when we enter into the, uh, actually this, paint, uh, this picture I took uh, in the Royal Palace in Spain. Uh, back then you can still take pictures, now you can no longer take pictures, which is really strange. Um, yeah, so, um, so you have the neoclassicism. And once again, we have uh, certain his historical context you might want to understand. Like, do you guys know what happened in 1789? French. French Revolution, 1774. 
the United States, right, the Declaration of Independence. So a lot of things are, are changing or happening. All the people that were enjoying the luxury and stuff, they were they were getting beheaded, right? They were getting like pushed out of the country, like all the all the new people, like the the middle class, like they're, they're taking over the bourgeois. And um, uh, so we enter into this new era where people actually like frugality a little more. They like morally uplifting stories. Um, so a lot of the uh, the, the buildings you, you think that are Greek and Roman are actually neoclassicism. Uh, like, the, what is this? <laughs> nope, not the White House. Common mistake. The Capitol. The Capitol. Right. Um, so, you know, it goes back. It, it uses, once again, the Roman and Greek pillars, the triangles. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans love the triangles. They think it's very stable, right? Like, if you have a chair, you have like three, three legs, great. Um, but then, uh, the Neoplatonists, they're actually Christian people. They're like, okay, we can use that idea. Yeah, three is stable, three is great. Besides, there's the Holy Trinity, right? The Holy Trinity is also three. Let's use that three idea. We like that three idea. So you'll see a lot of triangle compositions in neoclassicist, uh, neoclassicist paintings. Um, yeah, you have uplifting moral stories, you have triumph of rationality. They're very fine, meticulous, uh, meticulous brush strokes. It's no longer like, oh, I'm having so much fun, I'm a little drunk, I'm painting with wild brush strokes. No, no, everything is very well planned, designed, very meticulously painted out. Uh, you know, so on top of the first three we've seen, artists start to be able to paint for themselves, which is, which is, quite, which is quite something, like as, as the economic scenes change. Um, Francisco de Goya, which we're going to talk about, you have Eugène and Delacroix, and you have uh, uh, Eugène, sorry. Uh, you have Turner, the British guy, and you have Goro, I think he is a French man. Do people know Goro? No? Um, clearly you've seen this, right? What is this, triangle composition? Alright, let's move on. Uh, so this is not exactly a triangle composition, but there, is a lot of, there are a lot of threes in the painting. Um, I don't, I don't exactly remember the story, but it's supposed to be a morally uplifting story. Um, I promised to check it out yesterday, but I didn't. Um, so anyway, um, and you have Turner. So you know, no longer the the, the very like luxury uh, looking paintings. Uh, do you guys see uh, Skyfall? Yeah. Do you remember like James Bond and Q sitting in front of a painting and uh, Q handing over the gun and saying like, this is just a ship going to sink? It's, it's just this painting in the National Gallery in London. Right, Francisco de Goya. He, uh, right, 1746 to 1828, basically, time period of Romanticism slash Neoclassicism. <coughs> so he, uh, you know, when we talk about Albeco, he had an okay life. When we talk about Velázquez, he had a wonderful life. Uh, he had a horrible life. Um, he started off. Um, you know, he started off studying painting, and back then a lot of academies had been established. As you remember, Velázquez was trying to establish an academy. And when academies are uh, established, you now have to go through exams, you now have to, you know, like, you have a structural way of learning things, and it's no longer as free. So he went through the system, he studied painting, and he uh, worked as a, as a tapestry designer. He actually had, had some uh, pretty cute looking tapestries, we'll see in a bit. Um, tapestries are things you hang on the wall. Um, and um, he only became a court painter at the age of 40. Do you guys remember uh, what age Velázquez became the court painter? 26. 26, right? And then he went deaf. Uh, that was not great. <laughs> um, he went deaf, so there was a lot of like physical and emotional pain to him. And then at the age of 50, he, uh, he finally became the court painter. And 10 years later, the, the French invaded, and uh, you know, Spain was kind of in all kinds of turmoil. So he didn't really have a very comfy life. Um, right. Triangle compositions. These are all Goya's paintings. Uh, you know, triangle, 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 triangle. Um, these and a lot of these are actually tapestries. These, this is not, but these are all things like you know. He makes the design. People weave it onto tapestry, and then other like buildings buy them and hang them on their walls. Uh, kind of cute, right? Um, yeah, like the, the, the figure, but they don't really exactly look that realistic as compared to like Velázquez paintings. Um, but this is like the new, so I, you know, in, in that sense I didn't quite like the new classes and paintings because the faces are kind of like, like shorter than what a human being's uh, head would, would actually look like, but um, yeah. So, you know, he was a cool painter. Do you guys notice something different about this painting, the symbolism? There's one thing that changed pretty markedly. Did I hear something? The color. The color? Right. What is the color now? 
blue? What was the color? Red. So what happened? The Habsburgs, you know, they bred it within the family and they died off. Basically, that, 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 that Spanish branch just died off. So they invited the cousins from the, uh, from the uh, French court to come and take over, and they now become uh, the, Bourbon, the Bourbon house. And they're, they're, they're blue. Um, and they don't really look very king-like. At least when you look at Velázquez, you're like, oh, you know, like, it's the posture, like, you get a sense that that's the king. Um, I, I once heard some uh, commentators say this is like, you know, like um, a family of, of uh, the bakers at the street corner uh, winning a lottery and then posing for the, for the press. It's, yeah, it's, it doesn't feel great. Uh, but, I mean, the king liked it, so. Right. S these two paintings are some of uh, Goya's more famous paintings in his earlier years. Uh, not even uh, that early anymore, but like before he turned completely wild. Um, the Mahas. Uh, so there are some theories as to which, which these two women are. But first questions first. Do you think people like that painting in Spain? Why not? They're very conservative. They're very conservative. Actually, Goya got, uh, he, he got into some trouble. Like the Spanish Inquisition actually uh, you know, called on him and said, who made you paint this painting? <laughs> this is not great. This is corrupting. The society, but the theory is he painted it for the prime minister, and, and that's probably his mistress, <coughs> not Goya's mistress, the prime minister's mistress. <laughs> um, and um, so, so initially he painted that, the prime minister really liked it, and in the end, the prime minister was like, "Hmm, actually, I can't really hang it uh, in my living room. Why don't we like paint another one?" So he he painted another one. <laughs> um, yeah, Maha actually means um, so it's basically like lower class woman. Uh, in Spain, and likes to wear like fancy fancy outfits just to show off. But yeah, right. So, uh, uh, if you guys remember, by that time, um, Goya was already deaf. He couldn't hear anything, and he started to get a lot more depressed. So, if you remember his earlier tapestries, it was all like you know happy color, you know like bright yellow, blue, green, orange. Uh, he started to make art patents, and these are things uh, like etchings, like you use some chemicals to do on like a copper board and then like just uh, do his paintings. Um, so he started to satirize, okay. That is something that is also pretty different. So if we try to remember what we said earlier, who pays for the paintings, right? The churches, the states, they were trying to express certain ideals, you know, God is great, church is great, the king is great. Um, Nobody really talks about the bad side of things. Um, they, they don't really talk about like, oh, you know, they, they were commissioned painting for the triumph of a vassal, but they wouldn't really say, hey, humans are stupid. Right? They won't really do that. But Goya started doing this on his own, and partly the reason why he could do this is because the economic condition of him allows him to do this. And a few hundred years ago, that doesn't really happen. You don't really want to get, um, it, you're still mostly relying on, on patronage, but here he can do it on himself. Um, you know, two of a kind is basically like satirizing, um, you know, um, like like rich, like young people, and you have the sleep of reason produces monsters. It's basically saying, oh, he was uh, when he was awake, he was kind of going with the flow, and and when he fell asleep, you know, all his rational part came out. And it was like, what the heck was I doing during the day? It was like so silly and stupid, like human beings, folly, greed, all that, all that stuff. He's like satirizing that. Okay. And then the French people invaded. So, um, one difference is, do you remember what brush strokes Goya was using in his earlier days? Like, what would be an adjective to describe that? Fine, meticulous, right? This doesn't look too fine, meticulous. If you look at, I guess, uh, yeah, the projector doesn't really d uh, do it justice, but this is basically just like white, just painting it up. Like, his brush strokes are getting more and more broad and, and free. Uh, when he got his got his later years, and it has to do with the fact that he is no longer in the mood of complete rationality. Span, uh, Fr the French people invaded uh, Spain, even though they're cousins, um, and had a massacre. Basically, they the, it was the massacre of the third of May in eighteen o eight. In eighteen o two, they they had a bunch of Moors, meaning like North Africans, Muslims, uh, uh, riders coming in and raided the city, and they made arrests and they they had a massacre. Um, that was, that was the shooting, that was, that was the, 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 uh, the, what's the word, execution. And uh, he, had, he had another painting, which is the day before, which is when the people actually raided, raided the city. Um, yeah, it, it was not a pretty sight. So basically during the French occupation, uh, Goya still worked with the French 
uh, occupiers. And that, he didn't really paint for like the, 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 the fake king, as the Spanish would call it. I think it's Napoleon's cousin or brother, if anybody, if anybody here knows. But when the Spanish king was restored, he, uh, Goya never got in, in, back in good terms with, with the Spanish king. So um, he, had, he was deaf, and he basically lost his job. So that was pretty depressing. And that's when he started painting horror. Um, and that's basically what made Goya so great. So Goya already started painting things on his own. He started expressing uh, satire. He started calling human beings greedy, foolish, all these things. And that was never seen before. Like, people didn't do that. People don't do that. Um, you know, th this painting is called Saturn Devouring His Son. If you guys are familiar with uh, Greek mythology and stuff, like back then, like the, 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 the god of the universe, whenever he has a son born, he will eat it. He will eat the son. Um, and, and this is, this is part of uh, you know, that, that, that. That's not pretty, right? That's like father eating son. What kind of idea, what kind of ideas uh, is that painting trying to express? That, you know, that, that's just not something that people did back then. Um, this is called the dog, which is literally the dog sinking in the sand and nobody's helping him. Great. Um, two old men eating soup. Do they look like old men or like oh, ghosts, right? Skeletons and stuff. And this is called the Witch uh, Shabbat. Um, it's a bunch of women gathering, and like there's a there's a shade of the the oh, the devil uh, is usually in the shape of a goat. Back then, um, it's not pretty. Um, back then, what was he doing? He was in um, he was in um, Madrid. He fell out with the king. He bought himself a little house, or he could still afford to buy himself a little house. He started painting on the walls. He was living basically in solitude. Uh, he, he had a maid, but he was living in solitude. He was basically just painting all kinds of nightmares and horrors that came to his mind. And he used a lot of black paint in his paintings. Once again, this is what made Goya so great, because with all these you know, people asking you to paint something, people asking you to talk about you know, an ideal, like talking about like, the church, talking about the state, talking about the king, talking about like, vanitas, carpe diem, he started talking about the bad side of human beings. And it was so powerful. Back then, just imagine again, back then, if the only paintings you've seen in your entire life were those happy paintings. And now you see this. It's the first time you've seen it. It's so powerful. It, 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 it struck you. And that's what made Goya so famous in, in the history of art. Uh, this is fight, fight with, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, it, cudgels. cudgels. Uh, it's basically two men fighting each other to death. death. And that is the king. Uh, he was trying to say that the governments are trying to get its people to fight against each other so that they can rule very easily. It's basically just saying pick a fight among its people so that the rulers can sit there happily. Um, and this, this sense of um, expression had a huge impact on the later painters. And that's why he was sort of like very much idealized uh, in his later years. Um, and if you, like this is in the 1820s, right? Very soon there will be a, uh, like a worker, like a communist revolution in 1848, etc., etc. Like we're, get, get, we're getting really close to the, to the more recent years, and that's when self-expression becomes very important. So basically, we're done with our Spanish painters, and uh, there are a few points I want to make for the things that came after. Uh, cameras, cameras were invented, so people like Velázquez basically will lose their jobs because. People no longer really need royal paintings, they can have royal photographs. Uh, so self-expression becomes really important. It's about the ideas they're expressing. Like, okay, I want to, you know, like Picasso paint like crazy things. Uh, like cubism is about time, um, etc. Um, and there were the new social, economical and philosophical movements that, that drove the change in, uh, in the art scene. Uh, this, is, this is the Impressionism painting that most people might have heard of or seen. And galleries started to become a big part. Um, if you remember back then, there were no galleries. It was somebody coming to you, paying you a few uh, you know, silver coins, you paint a painting for them. You don't paint and put them in a gallery for people to come and see and buy. But patronage is no longer such an important, uh, well, it would be still nice if you have a gallery and people like certain people just come and buy like, five paintings off you and you may take a relationship. You know you can support yourself by selling paintings to certain people. But uh, you, you have the means to paint for yourself first now. You don't have to wait for somebody to come and pay for you to paint. Um, right, so sort of like as a wrap-up of what we saw 
today. You have the religious paintings of El Greco, mannerism, trying to find tension from harmonious ideals, and then you have uh, Velázquez, you have you know, the, the, the royal court, um, and you have the black paintings of Goya, basically, as I said, the divine, the secular, and the nightmares. And uh, does anybody know the name of this painting? Guernica, right? It's by Picasso's. It's not even purely cubism anymore, it's like a lot of his stuff mixed in. And I would give a special prize, even though I haven't bought anything. I give you five seconds. <laughs> Alright, okay, so this is Salvador Dali, and I think the name is something to do with like a nightmare caused by a bee sting stinging a pomegranate, uh, something about a gun and a barrel. Like it's a super long name, but yeah, that's cerebrism. <laughs> right, so. Uh, Thank you very much. I'll uh, take some questions first, and afterwards I'll uh, you know give you guys a little exercise on uh, a few paintings and see if you guys can guess what era it is from. But yeah, for now, no questions. <laughs>